Welcome to anyone watching, it's Craig at mysimpit.co.uk and welcome to part 16 of the front dash build. In this video we're going to be looking at the integration of an RS485 network into the front dash and that will be used to run a number of the panels. It will be based on the schematic that I used previously for the engine monitoring instruments but we'll now adapt that to run on a PCB based form. Once that's completed and installed into the front dash, we'll then produce two panels which will run on that initially. The first of which will be the angle of attack indicator and the second will be the UHF repeater. In looking at the design of those, we'll then look at their implementation into the front dash and we'll run some tests just to see how they're operating over that new network. Let's buckle up. The first thing to look at is the creation of the RS485 network. We can see here the schematic that I'd used originally, and I use this when designing it for the engine monitoring instruments. And for anyone interested in exactly how the network operates, if you refer back to that video I did, I'll go into quite some detail. What we're really looking at at this point is to take that original network that I made which was just spread out on a prototype board and putting that into a PCB form. What we can see here is the PCB for the master and on the left there we can see it's a shield that plugs into the Arduino Mega and that shield has three RJ45 sockets for up to three slaves. I've then created a number of PCB extension boards which have additional RJ45 sockets like what we can see here so you can expand the capability of that network for the number of slaves that it can stream to. So this is a much smaller footprint and I can mount this and have it within the actual front dash itself and that will minimise the, the length of any cabling needed to reach the, the slaves. I did two versions of the PCB for the slaves. The one on the right is a stepper specific breakout board and this one as a revision of one I did previously for the engine monitoring instruments has pinouts for driving two steppers from the one board and thicker traces. And the one we can see on the left here is a generic breakout board. So you've got a flexibility, a greater flexibility in breaking out to different kinds of components. I've also standardised the inputs to both of these as RJ45 sockets. So at this point I started to run a whole number of tests on the network to understand its requirements in the current draw and that's across a whole number of different slaves and components on them. The master draw is somewhere in the region of about 75 milliamps. The slaves just on their own with the Arduino Nano on at about 25 each, 25 milliamps each. And the addition of the easy driver boards, that's up to about 124 milliamps each. So even from a small network running a couple of slaves each with a stepper motor, you're quite easily and quickly up to 300 milliamps. None of my tests showed any problems or any instability in this network but I am aware that it is still a different method to running panels than that which I've typically used and therefore I've designed a monitor box that you can see now so I'll be able whilst running it in my sim pit to be able to see exactly what it's doing. If in the unlikely event it then behaves in any way I don't like or it's doing anything that I'm not happy with I've put a kill switch in place so I can just cut the power to it. We can see here now the network installed into the front dash and the monitor box down in the bottom right. Now the, the display for this is so bright, on the left here I've just uh, put another shot of that and we'll alter the brightness just so we can see what the measurements are. So in this test we're going to plug in one slave 
that has a number of components on it. And we'll be able to see the impact that that has on the network. So as we plug it in, the reading jumps and settles around about 240 milliamps. This measurement device is not as precise as my multimeter, but it does give a fair indication of, of what it's doing. And let's now plug in another slave, which will just be one of the generic breakout boards. But other than the Arduino Nano in it, there's no other components it's powering. And as we know, that will go up by roughly about 30 milliamps. But let's say in running this five period, there comes a point where there's something about the readings I don't like, or it behaves in a way that I'm not happy with. I've got the kill switch here just to cut the power to it. So at this point, you can just see the voltage that still sits on the network, but there is no current draw because that's been disabled. So with this network in place, it's now my plan to progressively add one at a time a, a number of panels uh, connected as slaves up to what I'd probably say would be a maximum number of somewhere in the region of 16 to 20. And it might be in adding panels, according on the components I'm powering, the readings tell me that I'm getting to the maximum capacity I'd want to run this at. So we'll now spend a bit of time looking at the first couple of panels that we will want to run on a slave on this network. Those panels are going to be the angle of attack indicator and the UHF repeater. And in this case, we're going to run both of those panels off the one slave. Separate to the network I've installed within the front dash, I've separately soldered together another one of the PCB masters and a few other slaves, just so I've got a test network. I can then use these to test these panels as I build them, so I'm happy that the network can drive them. And then I know that that new slave can just plug directly into the SIM pip. In this further test that we can see on screen, I'm just checking that the network will comfortably run an OLED using I squared C. What we can see here is the early formation of the angle of attack indicator and the various layers to it. I would say that for anyone interested in building some gauges like this, to refer back to the video I did on the engine monitoring instruments, because that went into quite some detail looking at it layer by layer. One thing I didn't have when building the engine instruments was a 3D printer, and I have found that it's come in really handy to, to have this and allowed me to build a lot of the various supports to hold uh, the different components at the back of this panel. It does seem quite funny to think that when I did the previous panel, I mounted in place 12 stepper motors with a, on a clear sheet of acrylic with a marker pen and a drill. And to think now with a 3D printer how it's so much more uh, accurate and uh, repeatable. On the left we can see some alignment tests of the pointer. And on the right the LED that will be used for the flag status. With each of the components tested individually, it's now time to run them all together. Through this test network, I can see that the best PCB to use for a slave is going to be the generic breakout board. And that's because we're not just running a stepper motor, we're also going to run an OLED for the UHF repeater. In the previous video, part 15 in this series, we did look at a number of different types of OLED and that was for use with a digital clock. The one that we're going to be using for the UHF repeater is a smaller variant which is 128 by 32 and that's going to be just the right size for this panel. At this point where all of the components are working and suspended at the rear of the panel we can see that the length of that which by the time there's a DC jack for the backlighting is going to extend to about 270 millimeters is too long for the front dash so i'll start to redesign as we can see here certain parts of it so we can rebuild it and it won't extend so far back some reprinted brackets save quite a few millimeters by reorienting 
certain components and others just shave off a few millimetres here and there. Taking what was originally the last but one layer at the rear of the panel and incorporating the power in for the back lighting into that, as we can see on screen now, that as itself saved quite a bit of length. So in rebuilding the rear of this panel with new brackets, it'll mean that it won't interfere with any other items in the front dash. Before we have a look and see how that turned out, we'll just take a minute to look at the one main single bracket which supported and held the OLED at the back of the UHF repeater panel. This test print as we can see here has mounting holes to hold it to the rear of that panel and it also has a rectangular cutout which will allow the pins to drop through but leave enough space for a header to be plugged into it and also has a one larger indentation that all of the all of the resistors at the back can sit in so it's it's suspended evenly and that will do nicely and it's really helpful to be able to design these because down the line when there's other panels that will need OLEDs suspending I've already got the 3D design ready to adapt and, and utilize for that this particular bracket will be reprinting the black PLA because the white PLA does allow the transmission of light so the back lighting of this panel and some of the others will bleed through and show around the edges of the display which we wouldn't want. So a number of tests on this panel, on the left we can see we're just scrolling through a whole number of frequencies um, on the UHF radio and just looking at the update of that. If you are looking to use an OLED in one of your panels, I really would take some time to play around with the different font styles and sizes to find the one which is most in keeping with that particular aircraft but also looks right and fits right with the display. The amount of backlighting needed is literally just one small snippet from a strip of 12 volt green backlighting and I 3D print a supporting bracket which can have a little DC jack on which we'll have a look at the completed version of that now. Simple design just for some clear crisp illumination of what in this case will literally be just a couple of letters that need backlighting. Now let's just take some time to look at the two completed panels which will run off one slave on a generic breakout PCB and we're looking at these now prior to their incorporation into the front dash and then at that point we'll bring them online and we'll run some initial tests. As we can see from the side profile of the angle of attack indicator the redesign, reprint and rebuild of the rear layers has made quite a bit of difference to the length and it's reduced it by what would be about 70 millimeters. I used a X27 type stepper to drive this gauge and that's the same type of stepper I've used for all of my gauges so far. I, I do also have some VID29 steppers and I've got so far as to run it and test on them and they seem very similar to the X27s albeit just a little bit noisier in their operation. But I would be interested uh, for anyone watching of what their experience might be if they've used both of those type if one is more reliable and has a longer life cycle than the other. So we're at the point now that both of these panels are fully complete. We're going to now install them into the front dash and bring them online. So we have a in cockpit view of the simulator and on the right hand side of the screen we actually have a close up of the physical panel. As regards the UHF panel there's not really a vast amount to see there other than the fact that it's displaying the same frequency as what there is within the sim and it updates to match and reflect that. But what we can look at is the angle of attack indicator and that's in terms of its movement and how that relates to what's happening in the sim. So we'll look at this gauge in use and a good way to do that is through takeoff because clearly the pitch of the aircraft is going to change at the point that we depart from the wrong way. 
It's a bit of a zoomed out view of that gauge in the sim and we're looking at it from a bit of a different angle than the actual physical one on the right. But we'll be able to have a look at how those gauges are moving relative to one another. The angle of attack indicator has a limited range of motion of roughly about 275 degrees and this is in keeping with the range of motion on most of the engine instruments. But what is different about this gauge is it does accelerate and move, the pointer does, a lot quicker in the sim than the others I've done so far. And the X27 stepper can't move as fast as what the pointer does in the sim when there's extreme movements of the aircraft. And whilst this isn't an issue for this gauge given its limited range of motion, it's very clear that a much faster stepper will be needed to drive instruments such as the altimeter to ensure that the pointer physically is in sync with that in the sim. This is something I'm now going to research into. I'm just going to cut the AC bus now just to trigger the flag on that instrument. Now let's just turn the volume down on that warning. So I'm pleased with the addition of this PCB based RS485 network into the sim pit and the first couple of panels that I've got to run on it. I'm now going to be getting to work on some of the other panels and I look forward to sharing those in the future. Thanks for watching.